Thank you for joining us for this Vetacuti Foundation webinar series. This is a little different. We're not doing a program specifically for surgeons, you know, training about robotic surgery or medical conditions that we talk about regularly. But this one is, is more general knowledge on yoga, the art of being. And I have only done a little bit of participation in yoga in my life. So I'm interested to learn more about what Dr. Dalela and Professor Priyadarshi, they're both professors, excuse me, have, have to say about this topic. Thank you, gentlemen, both for being here today and for the work you've put into making this an informative presentation, I'm sure. Thank you, Mr. Dave, for having me and Dr. Shivam here. Uh, today we are celebrating International Yoga Day. And on that day, we are deliberating with you all here about the merits and the need of doing yoga in our day-to-day -day life. For talking to us, we have none other than Professor Shivam Priyadarshi, who is my very fine, nice friend from Jaipur. He's a professor of urology and head of the department. He's one of the star urologists of, from India. And uh, he has intense interest in yoga, as you'll hear him. He has been from his childhood exposed to Gurukul Pranali in India, where he learned this yoga science. And ever since, he has been side-by-side -side mastering. So, since we are already late, I'll not take more time and I'll ask Dr. Shivam to start telling us about yoga. Welcome, Dr. Shivam. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Dalela, for those kind remarks. And thank you, Vatikuti Foundation and Dave and Dr. Mahindra Bhandari for giving me this opportunity. So at the outset, let me send and convey my greetings on 6th International Yoga Day. The picture that you are seeing on the screen is the first International Yoga Day being celebrated in India, in Delhi, on India Gate, where 40,000 participants came and did yoga. We know there are millions of people who are doing yoga today around the world. And there in the United States also, there are so many who are doing it regularly. So today's talk is on yoga, the art of being. If you just notice the title of the talk, I've written yoga and not yoga because the actual word is yoga, and I don't want to distort it. And you may be familiar with the phrase like the art of living or the art of well-being. But what I feel is yoga is not just the art of living or it's not just a sense of well-being, but the main purpose of yoga is realization of the self is the realization of your own being. So yoga actually is a series of steps and disciplines which carries you forward and helps you to realize your own being. So I call it the art of being. So my journey started quite early. And when I was 17 or 18 years old, this is a pic from Osho commune in Pune in India. And at that commune, I was given this name of Swami Dhyan Avahar. Since then, I became quite interested in yoga and meditation. We know our modern medicine is disease-centric, whereas yoga is a science of health, which integrates mind, body, and soul. If you go into the origin of yoga, it could be as old as the universe because the creator himself, the Shiva, is called Adi Yogi. But the actual evidence of yoga started in the pre classical era, which is around 5,000 years old, when in our ancient Indian scriptures, in Vedas, Rig Veda, and Upanishads, they describe various sages and saints who did penance in jungles, in mountains, in river, 
but there was no fixed format of yoga at that time. It was only in the classical era when Rishi Patanjali at around 300 BC wrote Patanjali Yoga Sutra and then he described and formulated yoga in a very systematic manner. After these, for many centuries, there was a lull. And only in the 15th century, there are few yogis like Yogi Swatvarama, who again rejuvenated yoga, but they stressed mainly on the body-centric practices. And he popularized Hat Yoga with his treatise on Hat Yoga Pradipika. And after that, in the 19th century, Sri Krishnamacharya, who is also known as the father of modern yoga, popularized Hat Yoga in India. And then his disciples, Pallabi Joyce and BKS Anger, and then later Vikram, they all opened up schools of yoga in various parts of the world, including the United States, and popularized Hat Yoga. And Hat Yoga, yoga became synonymous with Hat Yoga. But we know yoga in ancient India originated from a word which is in Sanskrit called yuch. And this yuch means uniting the individual with the absolute. And thus, yoga is not just an art of living. It is a science of realizing your own full potential. It's a journey which carries you from your body to mind in hat yoga and from mind to soul in raj yoga. And ultimately, it liberates the spirit from the illusion of time, space, and causation. Now we will discuss the eight limbs of Ashtang Yoga as described by Patanjali Yoga Sutra, by Rishi Patanjali. We can draw an analogy of our life journey with yoga to a car which is being driven on the road. The car requires fuel, right? So our life journey in yoga requires fuel, which is actually food, water, and air. And the asanas which we do in yoga are the lubricants. And pranayam is the battery. And the driving soul, the meditative soul, is the driver of the car. So let's begin our journey of yoga in this car. So when you go, when you drive a car, you need to know some certain rules. We need to follow certain rules of the road. And there are certain principles of driving a car. Similarly, in yoga, we have self-restraints. Those are the principles which are divided into five uh, moral uh, values which include non-violence, ahinsa, truthfulness, satya, non-stealing, asthya, moderation on all things, brahmacharya, and aparigra, which is non-possessiveness. So these are the self-restraints to be followed while uh, following yoga. But once you have these principles, you need to follow them regularly with fixed observance and self-discipline. And this fixed observances are divided again into five uh, qualities, which are shauj, which is called purity, santosh is contentment, tap is austerity, and swadhyay is the study of sacred texts, and ishwar pranidhan is living with awareness of the divine. So once you have these principles and you follow them regularly with self-discipline, then this journey is a very long journey. And once you have gone for a long drive, you need to have a very comfortable, relaxed posture for driving the car. Otherwise, you will feel tired very soon. So asanas help us to attain this comfortable, relaxed posture. 
while driving. And once you have this relaxed posture, then again, if your mind is not stable, if your mind is not quiet, because that's the character of mind, then again, there will be trouble in the journey. So pranayam, which controls your breath, helps to fighten your mind also. It helps to steady your mind and fight your mind. So this acts as a bridge between a body and mind. The perfect example is anger. In anger, what happens? The breathing becomes very fast and shallow. And when you are calm and peaceful, the breathing becomes slow and deep. So exactly that, that happens with pranayama. If you control your breathing, your mind becomes calm. So that is what is done by pranayama. So, so once you have a relaxed posture, your mind is calm and quiet, then again, it's very important to have a road map for reaching your destination. So today we have GPS system, all right? So in yoga also there is a GPS and this GPS is guru positioning system. And you need somebody to help you, to direct you in going to the destination. And now you know that your direction is not in the outer world. You have to go into your inner world to reach your destination. And this is what is done by Pratyahar. Pratyaha is withdrawing your senses which are being released outside in the outer world and withdrawing and directing it inwards so that you can concentrate in your journey in the inner world. So Pratyaha is a bridge between Bahirang, which is external world and the Antarang, which is the internal world. And once you go into the inner world, then you find that the world is totally different from outer world. And you have to pass through various strata. And this is divide, is uh, in yoga, it is called Panch Kosha. But the outermost layer is the Anandamaya Kosha, and the innermost is the Anandamaya Kosha, which is the state of bliss. So you have to cross all these strata to reach that destination. And the energy which is required in this process passes through two nerve channels, uh, which is called in yoga as Pingla and Ida Nadi. That is, one is the sun channel, other is the moon channel. And these two confluence at the Mulabhar, which is the lowermost chakra, that is the energy, wheel energy, wheel of energy. And there, with this confluence, they awaken the latent energy, which is called Kundalini. And this Kundalini energy rises up through the various chakras. And these chakras are, the lowermost is the Muladhar. Then you have Swadhisthan, the sacral chakra, then Manipur, solar plexus chakra. Then Anahat is the heart chakra. Vishuddha is the throat chakra. And Agya is the third eye chakra. And Sahasrar is the crown chakra. So, the energy goes from the root to the crown. And this corresponds to the various nerve plexus in the body and also to the various endocrine glands of the body. So once you are in this inner journey, then this road is very different from the outer world. The roads are very narrow and it's like going on a mountain with hilly roads which are meandering, right? And then you have to be very, very, uh, uh, have a very good concentration, a yeah, very uh, steady gaze ahead to go and, and to drive along uh, in your journey. So that is done by dharna. Dharna helps in concentration, in having a steady focus. And because we know our mind has, is always shrouded with 
thoughts. So you have dark clouds of thoughts and desires which are making your journey even more difficult. So once you have this dharna concentration, these clouds slowly, slowly pass off and you can go ahead in your journey. Once you have mastered these first six limbs of yoga, then there could be a state in which you find that the road ahead is totally cloudless. That is, it is lit with bright sunlight. That is the state where you reach the state of meditation. That is a state of thoughtlessness. There are no, no thoughts which are trying to disturb you. So that is meditation, dhyan. So once you have achieved that state with your constant effort and uh, regular practice, then there are very few people, fortunate people, who can actually reach the destination. And that destination is samadhi. And samadhi is actually merging of your own self into the whole. When your self merges into the pure consciousness and you become one, and that is you. Then the whole birth, rebirth, check stops and there is no going back. This was whole, all about the different eight limbs of you. Now we would discuss a little bit of science behind you. In 19th century, uh, there was a person called N.C. Paul in Bengal who did a few physiology experiments uh, with you. And then in later in 20th century, Kevalyanand and Yogen, they uh, started some institutes of yoga, uh, which studied yoga with scientific background. Over the years, we know that our brain is actually a triune brain system, which has three layers. The innermost is called the reptilian brain, which is the oldest in evolution. And then the middle one is the mammalian brain. And the outermost is the human brain, which is the neocortex. So the innermost, the reptilian brain, is also called reactive brain. And the function of this brain is for flight and fight response. That is, it reacts to any kind of uh, threat automatically. And because if there is a kind of threat, then the body will try to pump in adrenaline and cortisol. And this adrenaline and cortisol will cause, uh, empower the heart and muscles to deal with the threat. So in modern times, what is happening, there is constant stress and engaging in different kinds of such type of onslaughts and worries will raise the level of adrenaline and cortisol and cause harmful effect on the body, resulting in various conditions like obesity, blood pressure, diabetes, etc. And one more important quality of reptilian brain is that it cannot distinguish between the reality and virtual image. Like if you are going into the movies or you are on online, uh, some uh, social media, and you are seeing some type of this kind of um, threats or some types of this, it, uh, movies, then it can create the same type of response. And yoga will help us to calm down uh, the nervous system and reduce the damage that is caused by daily overstimulation of such type of uh, reactions. The middle brain is the emotional brain, which is also the mammalian brain. And this is responsible for our various emotions like joy, sadness, trust, disgust, fear, anger, surprise. And when this portion of the brain is not able to function properly, uh, it leads to antisocial behavior. And this part of brain is again wired to read emotions of people with whom we are interacting. So when we are physically interacting with somebody, we can actually read their emotions, which is not possible when we are doing this interaction digitally. 
And the outermost brain is the thinking brain, which is the human brain, which is formed of the neocortex. This is responsible for language, the complex social interactions, the abstract thought, imagination, imagination, and most importantly, it is capable of self-awareness. It is capable of self-realization. And this brain is also responsible for development of human culture, including the expression of beauty through art and music, social structures like language, laws, and justice. It has also the ability to control over the other two layers, both the middle and lower, uh, innermost layer. The fourth brain is the gut, which is a kind of a recent discovery. We know the, uh, there are almost 100 million neurons that are woven inside the walls of our digestive system. And this sends information to the triune brain through the vagus nerve. And some of our emotional states actually starts in uh, our gut. And almost 95% of the serotonin, which is the chemical for a sense of well-being and pleasure, comes from these gut. And many of us must have uh, experienced this gut instinct or the gut feeling. That can be amazingly accurate if we learn to listen to our gut feeling. Our brain is made of 100 millions of neurons. And this has trillions of synapses, which through their neural network connect to each and every cell of the body. So whenever there is an electrical signal which passes through this neural network, it forms a wave, which is that thought or a desire. And this passes through this neural network to each and every cell of the body and causes a release of a molecule, which is called a neuropeptide molecule, which is released in each and every cell of the body. So uh, if we say that each and every cell of our body is able to think, able to have expression of feelings and emotions, then it will not be wrong. This is the famous sculpture, The Thinker by Rhoda. Our brain is constantly bombarded with various thoughts. It is said that we have around 6,000 to 60,000 thoughts every day. And we are almost a hostage to these gang of thoughts. And we are aware of only a very tiny fraction of these thoughts in our consciousness. And vast majority of our thinking goes in the subconscious. And only few thoughts sometimes would breach into our consciousness. And these electrical signals, which are the form of thoughts, which are actually encoded with molecules and ions, which have masses, which have actual mass. And so if we say the thoughts are the heaviest thing that we carry are the thoughts in our head. Our mind is just a wandering mind. It wanders from here to there. It frequently visits our past and fantasizes about the future, but never stays in the present. And this is called the wandering mind or the monkey mind, which jumps from one branch to the other branch. The perfect example would be like, suppose if you see a dog on the road, immediately you have a thought that this dog was in, uh, you saw a dog in a particular family. And with that family, you would relate to another thought that you went with that family to a movie. And then you will have a thought of your, that movie. And again, in that movie, if you have seen Jennifer Lopez, then you would have the thought of Jennifer. And it so on goes on. It makes a chain of thoughts, which often we are not aware of. And we can actually have the tail end of the thought in our conscious mind. So meditation would help us to live in the present moment. And we can actually be aware of our thoughts also. So a wandering mind is usually an unhappy mind. So this was a 
kind of uh, study which was done on 2,250 participants, they found that almost half of them had their mind wandering. And people were very less happy when their mind were wandered, wandering. And the mind wandering was highest when they were working with some unpleasant feeling or the work which didn't interest them. And it was least during lovemaking, which has the highest level of happiness. So today, uh, the mindfulness has become a, almost a ubiquitous word. You can see it in the cover of Time magazine, in the Harvard Business Review, and even the New England Journal, Journal of Medicine. And there are so many magazines now which cover uh, mindfulness. And you have these citations which are growing exponentially in the last few years. And there are so many articles which deal with mindfulness. And there are I many we have a longer route articles which have their articles. Very good. It's good. Good day, no? I know. Uh, Dave, I have a little bit of disturbance here. So this mindfulness has been dealt uh, in various peer-reviewed journals, uh, beginning with Lancet, with British Medical Journal, and many other journals where they have done randomized controlled studies on mindfulness and meditation. So John Kaber, Jeanette, who is the director of the Center of Mindfulness in Medicine in Massachusetts, uh, defines mindfulness as paying attention in a particular way on purpose and living in the present and non-judgmental. It has to be non-judgmental because once you start judging your thought, you again fall into the same trap of the chain of thoughts. So when you observe your thought non-judgmentally, you can actually dissolve and can go out of that thought. So he developed this mindfulness-based stress reduction, which till date is probably regarded as the best technique for de-stressing. And then Santorelli again described it as a disciplined way of learning to pay attention to all that is arising within. And it is basic human ability to be fully present aware of ourself and our surroundings. So mindfulness is not a technique, it's actually a way of being said. So meditation actually pulls out of this unconscious and automatic thought patterns because we have a default setting where the mind is filled up with constant chatter, which is the monkey mind and meditation gives your monkey mind a job to do. You focus on your breath or you chant a mantra so that this thoughts actually dissolve gradually. There are various studies which have been done which shows that meditation can actually increase the cortical thickness. And here the functional MRI has been a game changer. It can actually tell you the function which is going on in the brain with uh, people who are doing meditation. So the application of meditation is that those who are not aware, whenever there's a stimulus, they would react to the situation. That is, it's an automatic kind of reaction without any kind of conscious thought. But those people who are self-aware, meditative, they will, with mindfulness, try to respond to the situation and not react to the situation. So there is a process called stop, where the S stands for stop. As whenever you face such a situation where you are stressed, then just stop for some time. Then T is for take a breath. Take a deep breath and O is for observe. Observe your bodily sensations, thoughts and emotions and disengage from what you are facing. And then you proceed. 
because by then you are trying to analyze the situation and then whatever you would do would come out of your own wisdom. So mindfulness can be practiced at any time, every hour of the day, even when you're going to bed before sleeping, if you are mindful, then your whole sleep can be very deep and relaxing. While eating, you can be mindful, while playing, while studying, working, seeing patients, doing your surgery, or while making love, or even if you're doing nothing, you can just keep focusing on your breath and be mindful. So we need to be mindful in every activity. We need to focus our breath if we are doing nothing. So let us establish a meditation as a regular habit. And we need to use the same place and time each day, which actually helps in the process. So talk less, listen more, reduce your multitasking, so slow down in your life, reduce your belongings and simplify your life. So you have two choices. Either you have, your mind is full of thoughts and you are not aware of it, or you could be mindful of your thoughts. There is a kind of term entropy, which comes from the thermodynamics principles in physics, where entropy is the excitability and chaos of the molecules which constitute matter. And human brain, which is an aggregate of nearly 100 billion neurons, they constantly crowd our mind and is a result of some total of simultaneous activity of all these neurons, the thoughts. And the sensory organs serve as an important pathway to increase this entropy as they stimulate various neuronal circuits. And thus closing our eyes will help in the process of concentration as it decreases the entropy. And that is why sleep deprivation leads to fatigue of this neuronal network. So when we are concentrating or doing meditation, we are increasing the synchronicity of a specific group of neurons and silencing the unrelated neuronal activity. And in this, in the waking state, when we are doing consciously this attempt, we decrease the entropy, that this chaotic state of molecules, which is referred to as meditation. As the entropy of neurons keep decreasing, there is a state of calmness which is perceived and they resonate in harmony. And as this orchestra gets more in sync, you experience varying states of bliss and happiness. Till what is presumably the final state of zero entropy, where all 100 billion neurons in the brain function in a total unified quantum coherence. And that is called Samadhi. We know in physics, when matter gets cooled to very low temperature, to absolute Kelvin of minus 273 degree, the entropy of the chaotic molecules in the matter decrease and the matter comes down to a zero energy state. And this zero energy state in physics is known as Bose-Einstein condensate. And it is very similar to what we experience in Samadhi. There are various qualities of a meditative mind which could be very obvious. Like we have two kinds of people. One who is, have a, an identity which depends upon others. Like other oriented people will depend for their happiness on others. They will feel good when others praise. They will feel bad when others despise. But meditative people are self-oriented people. They depend on themselves for their happiness. They take self-responsibility and feel and act according to their own wisdom. Similarly, there are two modes of existence. One is a having mode and other is a being mode. So having mode concentrates on material positions, power and aggression, which are the basis of universal levels of greed, envy and violence in the world today. And the being mode concentrates on inner growth, which is based on love, pleasure of sharing and creative activity. There's a term called English language, savoring, 
which is usually used for when we eat or drink something and we uh, relish each bite or each sip of that drink. Similarly, in life, we often forget to stop and enjoy the little things. Indeed, it's possible to go through an entire day either stuck in your ruminations about the past or anxiety over the future, never really seizing the moment and noticing the present things that are happening in present. And as you savor the moment, you notice those little things in the present, your day can, could be made special with, those, with the, that smile of a friend, with the kindness of a stranger, with the beauty of the sunset. All these things can only be savored if you are in that present moment. Equanimity is a very, is a quality of a meditative person where he has a mental calmness, composure, evenness of temper, especially in a difficult situations. He is a perfect, unshakable balance of mind. And it is a hallmark of spirituality. It is neither chasing nor avoiding, just being in the middle. And today, we have heard about the intelligent IQ, intelligent quotient, the EQ, emotion quotient. But the new word today and the ultimate intelligence is the spiritual quotient. While the computers can have IQ as artificial intelligence, animals can have EQ. It is essentially uh, the spiritual quotient that sets the human beings apart from brains and from animals and computers. So improving your IQ, EQ, and SQ can boost your AQ. AQ is the agility quotient. So AQ is an amalgamation of all these three, improving the facets of intelligence, and probably is the most effective way for the leaders today and for the various organizations and corporates to become more agile, to become more innovative and creative. So yoga not only improves your physical fitness, improves immune system, boosts the chemicals which are actually cause your sense of well-being, improves your lung functions, lymphatic system, removes the toxins, improves the functioning of organs, and works at the neurocrine endocrine level to decrease your anxiety, depression, and fear. But it also helps to conserve your creative energy, which can be used for different innovations and creations and your journey. It can improve your professional work. You can become more loving and caring. You are more willing to apologize and forgive. You become less vulnerable to any disturbance. You improve your interpersonal relationship. You develop wisdom to choose the right and you understand life's objective. It helps to make the world a better and peaceful place to live in. And ultimately, it helps to realize our divine self, our own state of being, the ultimate bliss or anand, which we all are striving for, consciously or unconsciously. So I'm coming to almost the last slide. Even if you forget everything about yoga and the different aspects of yoga, just remember this slide. This is the word Rab. Rab in Urdu means the Almighty. And R stands for relaxation, B for breathing, control over your breathing, and A is awareness. So if you can develop your awareness, on these two pillars of relaxation and breathing, then probably you are through your journey of yoga and you can actually realize your own self, your own being. Uh, this is a small video clip which describes the various meditative postures for meditation. Meditation. Dhyan is the seventh penultimate limb in the eight limbs of Patanjali Ashtanga Yoga. The first six limbs, 
just prepare us for meditation. In fact, there is no technique to learn meditation, but these only help us to be in the state of meditation, which is a pure state of awareness where thoughts no more control us and we are one with the existence. As said in Yoga Sutra, Chitta Vritta Nirodha. We can light some incense, have a soft background music, wear comfortable loose clothes and choose a natural airy surround. If not comfortable sitting on the ground, you can sit on a chair, but don't use the backrest. Instead, sit in the front part with your back straight. The best posture would be a sitting posture on the ground. You can take a small cushion and sit on the cushion in its front part so that the buttocks lie on the cushion. The first asana is a simplest one which is Sukhasana. The second sitting posture is a Ardha Siddhasana where the heel presses on the perineum and the right leg on the left thigh. So this is Ardha Siddhasana. The third posture is Siddhasana where the left foot goes on the right thigh. And the fourth one, which is the most optimum sitting posture, is Padmasana, where the two feet are on the two thighs. The whole objective of yoga is to learn to be in a comfortable, relaxed posture for meditation. As said in Yoga Sutra, Sthir Sukham Masanam. The eyes can remain either open or open or closed. Some people feel drowsy or sleepy with closed eyes. They can keep their eyes either open or half open. Head should be straight, not tilted back or on front. Chin can be slightly down at an angle of 45 degrees. Hand could be in various mudras. This is Dhyana Mudra or it could be Vayu Mudra, Sunya Mudra. Or the Surya Mudra. And the Prithvi Mudra. Dhyana Mudra where the left palm is considered as the world of illusion and the right palm, the spiritual world. Keep your back, neck and head in one straight alignment. Imagine yourself as a stack of coins or a puppet on a string which is being pulled up. With each inhalation, straighten yourself up and with each exhalation, relax yourself. For centering and finding the center of gravity, you can rock your body sideways or back and forth, finding your own center. Try to straighten yourself up and with each exhalation, relax yourself. Relax your whole body. Start from your feet. Try to tense them and then relax. Similarly, proceed up in your leg, thigh muscles, back, shoulders and head, especially the muscles around your eyes, face and scalp. Relax them completely. The thumb and 
observe your breathing. Our breathing has four phases. Inhalation is pura. Then there is a slight pause, which is kumbha. Exhalation is recha. And then there is a slightly longer pause, again kumbha. Remain aware of these four phases of breathing and observe. Remain aware of all sensations. It could be a pressure sensation. It could be some little pain in your back or it could be some tingling in your shoulders. Also remain aware of all the sounds in the environment or the smell. You might be distracted by some thoughts, but as you observe them, they tend to go and you come back to your own breath. Keep observing your breath. Gently open your eyes and let all the forms, images and colors come into your eyes and just observe them. Slowly unlock your Padmasana. Be aware of all the physical movements. You end with Shavasana. Completely relax yourself. Relax all the muscles beginning with feet to the head. End with Vajrasana. End up in Pranam with gratitude to the Almighty. Sound is considered as a cosmic energy and every form of matter, living or non-living, is a kind of vibration, which is again a form of sound. Even the seven chakras in our body, as described in you, have different sounds. It is considered to have immense healing power. The wooden saints have used bells or bowls, which when struck with the wooden mallet, produces a sound vibration similar to the cosmic nerve and is helpful in meditation. So I thank you for your patient and mindful listening. And I will end up with a kind of couplet from a Urdu poet called Galib. Uh, he says that Umr bhar Galib yehi bhul karta raha, bhul chehre pe thi aur aina saaf karta raha. I did the same mistake the whole life. The dust was on my face and I kept on wiping the mirror. I hope and I wish that all of us do not do and commit the same mistake and follow yoga, which could help us in realizing our own being. Thank you very much. So, uh, thank you, Dr. Shiva. This is wonderful. Simply wonderful. Never ever I have been glued to a screen so much with so much of concentration uh, ever before. So thank you for making yoga so simple and so understandable. Your metaphor as the journey on the road along with the yoga practices was immaculate. And I think it improved the understanding of the people. The larger part of your talk was uh, aimed towards convincing people to adopt meditation in their life, which is genuinely so. So I hope the audience is hugely benefited. 
with your Discord here. And I'll be happy to take questions from people if there are any. I see lots of congratulatory notes though pumping on the chat box. I see no questions. You probably have left no question for them. Bye. I would request Dr. Mahindra Bandari to please come in and uh, give his uh, comments. Uh, thank you, Shivam and Dipanj. Uh, sorry, Divakar. Uh, uh, sorry, I am outside because there was a power outage, which rarely happens in the house. So I was a little late in joining your thing, but I think most of it, I got it. I congratulate you on developing this thinking, which is uh, not very common in the specialists because and the surgeons, particularly because we, we are attuned to a particular kind of living, thinking all the time, and solving individual patient problems. But this is what you rightly brought out. This is not an add-on. It is a solution to your problem. If you have a complex problem, when your physical limitations of knowledge come in, you connect to that divine, unlimited source of energy to solve your problem. So I congratulate you on that. And thank you very much you and Devakar for coming in. Uh, before I hand over to Dave, I would like to tell to the listeners, many of them, because I don't expect very large audience for this kind of subject, because the interests are somewhere else. But those who are there, I am very confident they are committed and many of them are in that, that uh, state of mind which Shivam described. Only thing I'll tell you, there are four stages of achievement. One is in denial mode when you don't feel the need of it. Second stage is you like somebody like Shivam speaking these things. They are good to your ears. According to me, at that stage, you have crossed 50% of the path. But most important thing is to practice it to do it yourself. According to me, I have gone from Vipassana to all kinds of meditations and in pretty in deep, and I have come to a one full circle that it is very simple. Which technique you follow is not important. Can you sit in inner silence? Meditation is closing eyes. And just sitting down and let things happen at that moment. I would say for beginners, don't even get into the breath. Yes, it's good you can do that. But only if you can sit at one place for whatever time you can do, let things happen. Don't resist the nature. Let energy flow in. Don't block the energy. Just whatever thoughts come to you, don't entertain them. Body is like very impervious to thoughts. These thoughts will come and hit you as arrows, but rebound back if you don't welcome and entertain them. So I think I cannot uh, say more than what uh, Shivam has said. And uh, once again, congratulate him for this angle of his personality, which I had not known or which I could not perceive when I had known him several years ago. So thank you once again. Thank you very much. I have, I have, I have some, some comments to make that yoga, as most people often perceive mistakenly as a sheer exercise. Or some people perceive as sheer thinking, meditation, sitting in silence, observing. But genuinely, this is a science. And the beauty of science is, the fundamental of science is, it tells you that if you do X experiment this way, follow the methodology of experiment properly, the Y will be the result. A science tells you this. This is the fundamental of all sciences. The same fundamental is applied to yogic science. If you do the way it has been described in yogic scriptures, the way it has been told correctly for you to do, whether it is an asana, whether it is a pranayama, whether it is dhyan, dharana, 
or meditation, if you do the way it has been told, it is just like repeating a scientific experiment. You are bound to get that result of the science. So please believe in yoga as science to live, as science for being as Shivam highlighted, not science for well-being. Yoga is not a self-help tool to, to let you master your physical body or let to improve your uh, mental thinking process. It's not a tool. It is a science in itself completely. And please do it the way it should be done. Yeah, so, I, I totally agree with you. Totally agree. And I agree uh, with Dr. Bhandari what he said about that what matters is your experience. So uh, reading, learning, and uh, hearing about yoga and meditation would not make you different, would not help you uh, much. So what is more important is trying to start practicing, trying to experience yourself. So whatever you feel that is good for you, you should keep on practicing and definitely you will find results in it. So yoga and meditation is something which is totally based on your own experience and reading and literature would not help much in uh, such a subject. Uh, there are two questions, doctor. Uh, can you just uh, let me know? Uh, in the question box, probably there are two questions as Dave also told me. Uh, one is, as I could see, uh, was on transcendental meditation. And let me tell you, uh, there are various techniques of meditation, but they are not actually meditation. Meditation is something which cannot be done. Meditation is something which you can enter into. It's a kind of state which you can enter with your efforts of our, with the various techniques. So there are various techniques to enter into that state of meditation and transcendental meditation is one of them. And there are various other, meditations. Vipassana Dhyan is there and you have Kundalini Dhyan, Kundalini meditation. And then in Osho community, we used to do uh, dynamic meditation. So well, there are various types of meditation where you need to uh, do a kind of catharsis. Catharsis in the sense that whatever you have conditioned yourself, you try to decondition yourself, try to let go yourself. And in that letting go, probably you can reach that kind of state where you uh, have a totally uh, clear sky. There's a totally thoughtless state where you actually, uh, actually um, it makes you very, very happy and uh, what is called as bliss or the anand. So actually, when you have uh, you go through this meditation experience, even if it is momentary, you will feel that you are feeling so good after that, as if the love is flowing out of you. And love is not for a particular person or a particular thing. It comes out of you with, for everything. So meditation is something which changes your character totally. So I think, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Dalila, is there any other question? Then I can uh, just... No, I think that's fine. Yeah. I can see only one question on transcendental meditation. That's about all. Okay. I think uh, that's uh, fine then. Uh, yes, yeah, Dave. Yeah. There are two questions in the Q&A box. And yeah. the first one says, Sir, what does your say about the prayer during which a person focuses only on prayer, leaving all the thoughts? Can it be a kind of meditation? That's our first question. So the question was on prayer, right? Yes, it was. So, right. So uh, it doesn't depend what actually you are doing, uh, whether uh, you are uh, in a prayerful mood or whether you are working uh, in your normal profession or you are even if you are having uh, your uh, meals or having your uh, bath, Whatever do you do, if you are doing it with full awareness, with uh, full consciousness, then uh, this becomes a kind of a meditation. So definitely prayer, because prayer, uh, when you are in a prayer, then definitely you have that kind of atmosphere where you 
tend to become meditative. So if you are aware of those moments, then uh, you are actually in a meditative state. But again, uh, uh, this could be a, a kind of a thing that if you, again, there are thoughts uh, going in your mind while uh, doing the prayer, then again, it becomes the same mundane thing uh, as we do in the routine work. We do have one more question from the same individual who says, sir, it was very interesting. All the other benefits are obvious, but what about toxin removal? How does it so? Uh, what exactly? What do you see? They're, they're asking about, is there a benefit of yoga to toxin removal? And maybe this does not pertain to your talk at all. How does yoga help in detoxifying the body? That's what okay. Okay. Right. So uh, definitely, uh, yoga uh, would help in improving your uh, physical and mental fitness and uh, improve. As I said, I enumerated all those things. It helps to improve the immunity. Helps to improve uh, the sense of well-being by boosting the chemicals, etc. But these are all byproducts of yoga. This is not the actual aim of you. So uh, you can detoxify with various other uh, therapies also. But you, in its main objective, is to how to develop your own awareness, how to develop your consciousness, how to so that you can actually realize your own self. And that is the whole objective of you. Maybe I can add a little bit to this. Yeah. That uh, if you see this concept of toxins in the body, most toxins come from cellular metabolism in different parts of our body. May it be liver, or may it be gut, or may it be pulmonary uh, tree, lungs, or, or may it be our large muscles, whereby action toxins are accumulated. But these toxins get accumulated in the interstitial fluid of our body. Right? Now, when we do yoga asanas, we stretch our body differentially in a particular manner. And when this stretch is created, it kind of squeezes the particular part of the body as if you squeeze the wet towel. And when you squeeze the wet towel, all the water will flow out. And when you squeeze the particular part of the body, the interstitial fluid, which has been stagnating all around those cells, and this interstitial fluid is loaded with toxins coming out of the cells, this fluid is pushed into lymphatic circulation. And then it goes into the larger circulation. Now, when you unwind the towel, when you relax the body tissues, there occurs a kind of reperfusion. Fresh blood comes and you get a fresh lymphatic flow and you get a fresh interstitial fluid. So yoga as a science is a technology to replace your old junky interstitial fluid from fresh, vibrant fluid, which is full of nutrition and nourishment. That is how it detoxifies your body parts. With pranayam, you detoxify your lungs and interstitial tissue of the lungs. With asanas like kapal bhati, you detoxify your gut and retroperitoneum to some extent. And with other musculoskeletal asanas, you detoxify your muscles. So it does operate at that level. Yeah, definitely, yes. But again, uh, I think uh, we need to think of the larger picture of yoga. Uh, and I think that should be the main objective uh, of yoga. And I wish uh, all the people who are uh, listening to us and viewing, uh, I again wish them a very happy International Yoga Day. And I wish them to uh, include yoga in their lives. And I think this would make a tremendous change in their lives if you actually make yoga as part of that. Uh, thank you very much. And I, I just, before you end, I just like to say one more thing to everybody, the listener, that uh, yoga is going to, yoga is going to not only improve your physical fitness and mind and by meditation, but it energizes your energy circuits. As Shiva mentioned in the chakras thing, that the flow of energy into our body is made into the way it should be. Suppose you have a computer, which is a hardware and a software, and you connect to a power supply, which is erratic. 
will your computer functioning proper properly so our body has to have a sound energy flow and the energy flow has to be in a particular direction in a particular manner so yoga serves to not only improve your physical fitness body and mental fitness but also improves to streamline your energy flow and remember we work with our body the manual labor work with our body the work people remember about that work only for few hours those who work with the mental state their creation is remembered for few years but those who work with their energies are people like gautam buddha and ram krishna paramahans there are people who work with their energies their work is remembered for centuries and probably forever so let us all adopt yoga principles to evolve our energy to that level thank you very much thank you very much and once again thanks to vatkati foundation for giving us this opportunity